Tom Clark's 6M Podcast is a Boink Studios production. And now, on with the show. Hey, hey, what is up? Welcome to Tom Clark's 6M Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Clark, and in this episode, I'm joined by co-host Phil Lindsay. From the Marvel Cinematic Universe comes one of the most popular and beloved films of all time, Captain America's Civil War is directed by the Russo brothers, Anthony and Joe Russo, on a screenplay by Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. It is, of course, based on the characters appearing in Marvel Comics, created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, primarily. The film is, of course, produced by Kevin Feige. It stars all of your favorites, all of the characters that you have grown to love through the years that appear in the MCU. We will get to the cast, we will get to the story, we will get to everything involved in very short order. This film released on April 12, 2016 in Dolby Theater and May 6, 2016 in the United States for its release. Total running time, 147 minutes. The budget was $250 million. It may have made some bank kids at $1.15 billion. And that is the lowdown on Captain America Civil War. As you know from the title of this particular episode, yes, this is part one, Civil War is a huge movie, not just in terms of scope, but of course in terms of uh, the the runtime and everything about it. Uh, The scope of this film is pretty big. This is something we're going to see played out in films that follow this one and also on series that air on the Disney Plus streaming service, the events of Civil War are felt for a long, long time to come. And also we're going to feel the same thing in the two amazing Avengers films. We're talking, of course, about uh, Infinity War and Endgame. Um, but this really sets the stage for all of that. As we said, it's a huge movie. Yes, this is part one. The entire episode here runs for two hours and 40 minutes. So yes, it's been split in half. One hour 20 here, and of course, one hour 20 for part two. Stay tuned for that, and let's get to it. Captain America Civil War, part one. The Beatles couldn't last forever. No, you didn't click on the wrong episode to listen to. Stay with me. The Beatles couldn't last forever. There were two major alpha males in that band, as everyone plainly knows, John Lennon and Paul McCartney, obviously. And... When you have two alpha males in the same creative setting at the same time, eventually those two alpha males are going to start butting heads. doesn't mean they don't love each other. In fact, part of the reason they butted heads as much as they did was because, yes, they loved each other. They were lifelong friends. They grew up together. They got famous together. They had their highest highs together, their lowest lows together. But everyone at the time knew, and maybe fans wanted to fool themselves. That's how we tend to do as fans oftentimes. At the time, people maybe didn't want to face the fact that one day the Beatles may not be here anymore, at least as a foursome. And that does apply in some other aspects of what we like to talk about here on the show. And it definitely applies in what we're talking about here today when we're talking about Captain America Civil War. Of course, the Lennon and McCartney of this little conversation is Tony Stark and Steve Rogers. And obviously, there's a lot of differences uh, you know, of course there are, but the bare minimum at the at the basic discussion at its at its most black and white here, in my opinion, there's a lot of parallels. These guys, you know, got into this the hero business together, sort of at the same time. Uh, you know, barring Cap's uh, a previous run before he went to the ice, of course. And but everything that happened afterward, the the formation of the Avengers, they saw again the highest high and the lowest lows people that they cared about and that they loved died uh, sometimes right in front of them. And it, it became, these guys went through hell together and back, went through war together and back. And, you know, at some point they're going to start having issues. Doesn't mean they don't love each other. Doesn't mean they don't respect each other. But at the end of the day, there's going to be a difference of opinion. Differences of opinion is what makes us unique. And oftentimes what makes good relationships and great friendships along the way which is, I think, what's happened with Steve and Tony. But however, for the sake of this movie in particular, those differences um, led to many catastrophic problems throughout the course of the story. This is the third Captain America film to this point, uh, rounding out the trilogy, the fourth one we're very much looking forward to. By the time you listen to this or choose to listen to this, God knows where we'll be in the world. Uh, We'll wait and see. 
But yes, this rounds out the initial trilogy of Captain America films. This feels like an Avengers film, and with very good reason, because there's a bunch of Avengers in this movie, kids. But Phil, I'm going to hit you right out the gate. Hardball question, right out the gate. Uh, and I was going to save this till we got to the actual disagreement with the Scovia Accords, but I'm going to hit you with it right out the gate here. Whose side are you on, Tony or Steve? Uh, yeah, always Steve. It was Steve when I read the book. Um, it was Steve again when I when I watched the movie. Yes, they do an excellent job in the book, and they do an excellent job here, trying to make you see. And man, I felt like the movie did a better job of making me see where Tony was coming from. But I'm with you. I'm a, I'm a Captain America guy. What is it about Tony's argument, his basic argument, that made you shake your head and say, "No, nah, I I can't go that route." Um. Well, I mean, in the book, I feel like. I feel like it was kind of worse in the book because I feel like some of the things that Tony does in the book are a lot worse. I feel like the movie actually does a better job of getting you to understand his side, even though I still feel like he's wrong. Um, You could see why he felt the way that he did. Um, There are certain things that he says here that I'm just like, no, no, no. (laughs) Um, He, the, the way that he looks at this conflict is very telling because it's it's we're we're talking about a guy that has has had dealings with the government in a big way um for most of his professional life um because he built weapons um so he's looking at it like no this is what we have to do uh to keep this thing moving like we just gotta we gotta deal with this for now and then we'll come back and amend it later and it's just a very uh it's a very short-sighted way of looking at it yeah, it, it is kind of interesting how he was button heads with the government as much as he was, in particular Thunderbolt Ross, and then come to find out he's actually going to work with them. Um, and we'll get there through the course of this review here, but yeah, uh, I'm with you. I, I feel like that Cap's side is the right side. I, I just, having said that, I can see Tony's point. I can see the idea of we need to be held accountable. Uh, this, you know, we there, we've caused too much damage because you see like the Battle of New York, what happened in Sokovia, what happened um, uh, in D.C., uh, going back to Captain America, the Winter Soldier, all these things the Avengers had a hand in. And it's like, you know, we don't really think about collateral damage. Uh, you know, we, we got yeah. glimpses of it, like in the Spider-Man film with the Vulture and everything. But I kind of I kind of see his point at the same time that they got so, they got an answer to somebody. Right. I have a take here and I don't know. How many people will agree with this take? Ah. Um, the Iron Man trilogy is not very good. Um, <laughs> it's <laughs> it's it's not very good. Like the first movie is good, and then I feel like the third movie is probably my favorite. Um, yeah. But I feel like um, all of Tony's character development really starts to take off um, after the Avengers movie, um, and I feel like he his real main character arc starts in the Avengers movie. And I feel like that's part of why I believe Iron Man 3 is a better movie because you get kind of the basis of his character arc in that movie as well. But I I feel like him getting out of his element because um, he's kind of like the catalyst for what, and not even kind of the catalyst, he is the catalyst for what builds the, the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe and what builds everything that leads to the Avengers. He's the first, he's the first one. Um, and I think because of that, we see him getting more and more out of his element with each movie. And the more and more he gets out of his element, the more afraid he gets. Mm. And the more afraid he gets, the worse decisions he makes. You think the lack of character development in the trilogy is maybe done by design because they wanted to show you the development in the Avengers films, maybe? Um, I don't. I think that I think that they hadn't I think that they hadn't found the formula that works yet. I uh-huh. think that they tried to make Iron Man 2 so much of a setup movie that they missed a lot of the, the character develop, development that needed to go into that movie. Right. I feel like Iron Man 2 didn't have much of a script, and that was why it wasn't that good. Um, I feel like they handle uh, the singles trilogies a lot better now. Um, and you know maybe part of why the Iron Man trilogy isn't as good is because it was the first one, and they had to 
you know, deal with the growing pains as a studio before, uh, you know, they got together. And I, ah, man, I've said for a long time, I would love to see an Iron Man four, but of course we won't see that. <laughs> yeah. It, they could have had a chance. There was a chance there to get it done. And, and maybe, you know, could maybe, maybe would have been the best Iron Man movie, maybe even top the first one, because you would have had a fully formed, mm-hmm. But you know what, dude? At the same time, you could also argue that the fully formed Tony Tony Stark didn't happen until he snaps his fingers in Endgame. That's the fully developed character of Tony Stark is when he sacrifices himself, which is maybe could explain why he didn't feel complete until the very end. Um. Yeah, I I feel like he de- he develops more across the across the Avengers franchise. Yeah. Um. I still. I still will battle to death that Iron Man three is the best Iron Man movie. And there's a lot of stuff he, he goes through in that movie that um, by extension, you know, translates to the Avengers franchise and even this movie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a good take. I, and, and I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I just, uh, looking back on it, maybe I'm giving Marvel too much of the benefit of the doubt, um, you know, to suggest that they tank the trilogy uh, to to have him develop, I'm not really suggesting that, but I am saying, due to his character and what he had to do in the end, to bring it home, to bring it full circle, maybe there wasn't a choice. But I don't know. We'll never know at yeah. this point. Well, I mean, they didn't have they didn't have a plan at that point to probably right. end it the way they did, and they probably. I, I just think that they didn't. They weren't ready for how big the Marvel universe got at that time. I think that they thought. Hey, let's let's set up some cool stuff in, in Iron Man two, and you know we'll make some money. Yeah. Like now, you know these things are treated, you know, a lot more seriously. Yeah, they're like hey, it'll be a few movies. We'll have some fun, and the fans are like, oh, we want more. So they just kept blowing yeah. it up. And <laughs> well, you know, MCU. Year, fast forward years later, here we are talking about not the first Captain America movie. We've already done that. Not even a sequel, but the third one. So there you go. Um, you guys know how this how this works. If you've ever listened to the six and six and before, we dive pretty deep into these films. Um, we do talk about Marvel quite a bit here on the show. Of course, it's the third M kid. Try to keep up with us. Um, this movie in particular takes place two years after the events of Winter Soldier, and one year in terms of continuity time after the Age of Ultron. Um, we get the returning cast here. Chris Evans is, of course, is back. Um, as Steve Rogers slash Captain America, Sebastian Stan is back as Bucky Barnes, also known as Winter Soldier. Um, uh, you know, th- again, the, the heavy hitters of the cast are back. No Nick Fury in this film this time out. There's a few people not showing up here. Um, but yeah, and, and of course we've got Sam Wilson. The Falcon is in this movie. Dude, I, and, and I hate to lead off with that, but man, we talked quite a bit at Winter Soldier about the job that Anthony Mackie did. I mean, which which performance was better for you, uh, Anthony Mackie and Winter Soldier, or Anthony Mackie and Civil War? Uh, probably this movie, just because he's given more to do. Yeah. Um, ah, it's tough though. I I do think that they did such a good job of introducing him in in Winter Soldier. Yeah, I agree. And and as you said during the review of that film, they really do set the table to why this guy deserves uh, to become the next Captain America. Scarlett Johansson is back as Natasha Romanoff, also known as the Black Widow. Um, so yes, we're getting uh, some of the he- some of the favorites back. Don Cheadle is back as jo- uh, James Rhodey Rhodes, also known as War Machine. Jeremy Renner is back as Clint Barkin- Barton slash Hawkeye. Um, Paul Bettany is back as the Vision. Elizabeth Olsen is back as Wanda Maximoff, also known as the Scarlet Witch. Paul Rudd is back as Ant Man. Um, also from the Winter Soldier, making her return, Emily Van Camp as Sharon Carter. We get two, uh, and, and plus we got to mention Frank Grillo as uh, uh, Brock Rumlow, also known as Crossbones. William Hurt is back as uh, Thaddeus Ross. We get three big debuts here, Phil. We get Daniel Brohl as Helmet Zero, Baron Zemo. Freaking great. I love this guy to death. Um, and we'll get into that here, I'm sure. But we also get the late, great Chadwick Boseman, as T'Challa, also known as the Black Panther, and Tom Holland's first spin, uh, pun intended, as Peter Parker slash Spider-Man. Two major, three big debuts, two major debuts in this film. Dude, why do you think this wasn't just an Avengers film? Have we ever gotten an answer to that? Or just 
it was always supposed to be a Cap film. I mean, do you think it would have played differently had it been titled Avengers instead of Captain America? Uh, well, I mean, at its core, it's a, it's a Captain America movie. I know people are like, it's an Avengers movie because it's, it's Civil War and it has all of these ties. Um, but I think there's so many reasons why this is a Cap movie. And watching it again, um, I... I like I just will strongly disagree with people that are like this is an Avengers movie masquerading as a Cap movie, yeah. um, because all of the major themes of it are Cap themes. Like I mean, first of all, the the main underlying theme is a political theme. That's Ooh. Captain America. Um, the the main instigating factor is Bucky. Um, they tied up the they tied up the arc with him and Peggy here. Um, even when you look at the stuff with Tony. It's an extension of the first movie of of Steve knowing his dad. Um, I mean, there's there's other stuff that I'm probably missing, but most of the most of the themes of this movie are tied directly to Cap. Yeah, I agree with that. Most of the big time story beats in this film are directly tied to Captain America, hundred um, percent. It is told from maybe not his perspective, but his world's perspective. His little corner of the MCU is the one telling the story. Um, yeah. yeah, I agree with it, that. I mean, he ends. It ends on him. He's the last. He's the last person to be seen on screen. Uh, spoiler alert! Good call. Yeah, good call. Um, let's jump into this thing here, kids. Uh, the first thing we see out the gate is Winter Soldier. It's a flashback. He's being activated for a mission. Uh, he's being read to from a book with a star on it. We can pretty well guess where that book came from. The words in sequence, and try not to let this activate you, kids. If any of you want to pick up a firearm during the middle of this, restrain yourself. Um, longing, rusted, 17, daybreak, furnace, 9, benign, homecoming, 1, freight car. It's ingenious. I love this idea. I love this idea of, you know, no, in no other place will these words be mentioned in this sequence except in this book to activate Winter Soldier. That's why it can't be Mary Had a Little Lamb as Fleece was White as Snow. Because if he's walking around and hears that, he suddenly starts killing people. So, uh, dude, this this delves back into some of the espionage stuff from from uh, Winter Soldier. I love this stuff to death, man. I think this is a great touch for this character in this film. Yeah, and I feel like it's it's something we've seen in other spy movies of stuff like you know, mm. you know, the codes to activate KGB uh, sleeper agents. Yeah, um, yeah I, I just think it's just a great uh, it's a great thing to use here. Um, the way that they use these flashbacks throughout this movie and, um, of course, you know, seeing it the first time I didn't know, you know, what it would go back to, but watching it again and just the way that they placed these flashbacks and showing us more and more from this flashback every time was just ingenious. And you have answered my, my big time tough question. Number two of this particular pod, um, was cause we, we see winter soldier run a car off the road and take something from a briefcase in the trunk. And my second question to you was, did you think anything about this at all? Or were you just settling into your chair in the theater and saying, oh, I wonder what this is about? I mean, how early does your brain start working in these movies? Are you already trying to connect dots or it's too early to know anything yet? Oh, I, I was on along for the ride. But I think the thing that makes this movie so good is it tricks people into thinking that it's a popcorn movie. It has so many other things going on under the surface. You're supposed to think that this is just a way to get all these Marvel characters on screen and have this big, you know, action fight. And you have all this other, you know, stuff that makes you think under it. Um, it's just, it's just so good. And this, and the way that they use this flashback throughout the movie is a perfect example of that. And man, this film came out around the same time as Batman V Superman, because it, I remember there was a third film, if I'm not mistaken, that was a versus movie. And I'm, I remember thinking when it was all said and done, man, nothing compares to Civil War because this is an actual reason for two guys to want to fight. That it's like, and we've covered the DC Extended Universe here uh, because for reasons, but like there was no reason for those two guys. There's every reason <laughs> in the world for John and Paul to have an argument in the studio. There's every reason in the world for Steve and Tony to come to blows in the end of this. I mean, it's, Man, you can't even compare the two uh, for many reasons. But right off the bat, you can't compare the two because this feels like like a logical, cohesive reason for these guys to start hating each other's guts. Yeah, I mean, when you start your franchise on your two main 
uh, your main superheroes fighting. It doesn't really make sense. Um, mm. By the time we got Civil War, we've we've had a time. We we've gotten to know both of these characters by now, um, and they've done enough to set up this conflict by now. Um, you can't come straight out of the gate and give us get back, right? <laughs> to right. go to your Beatles analogy, you've got to give us get back after they've had a whole career together. Mm. Otherwise, you don't care. Otherwise, it's just some band that's falling apart right out the gate. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, the flashbacks continue uh, throughout this film, as Phil said. But we go from this to Lagos in the present day. This is the first big, uh, uh, the first big uh, to do in this film in terms of effects and explosions and uh, uh, punchy, kicky stuff happening, and. Uh, it starts off plain enough with the sort of the espionage take. Wanda is there, Natasha. They're all sort of in plain clothes, dark glasses, trying to hide their identities and whatnot. Cap's in a uh, a hotel window, and he's overseeing the situation. Sam's on the rooftop, and basically, what we are we are told here is that Crossbones, uh, the aforementioned uh, Frank Grillo's Brock uh, Rumlow from the Winter Soldier, is back, and he is full blown heel now, kids. As he says in the course of this, these upcoming scenes that Cap dropped a building on him, pretty much. So, uh, yeah, he's full-blown heel here for sure. Agent of Hydra and all the above. Um, dude, talk to me about this sequence. Uh, we're told that Rumlow is here to steal a biological weapon. We get to see the Avengers working together. It's There's some great moments in the in the midst of all this. Um, what, what to you in this sequence in particular stands out in, in the opening shots of this film? Um, I really like how this is, uh, it's kind of parallel to the opening sequence to Winter Soldier. And mm. it's kind of like the same kind of thing, but instead they're not working for S.H.I.E.L.D. Like you're getting this from the Avengers point of view and Captain America calling the shots. Uh, I really like how they shot the initial scene where we first see Cap calling the shots from the bedroom where we don't see him. It's, the shot is always from behind him. Um, and when we when we first see him, it's when he jumps in action. Mm. Um, I, I love the way that they introduced Red Wing here. Um, I thought that was a really smart way to use the bird from the, the comics and not have Falcon actually going around with a Falcon and, and using the tech. And the tech is really cool. Um, I thought that was a cool way to uh, upgrade um, Falcon's gear as well. Um, I just love watching cap lead a team in any of these movies like he's just so good at it um he just does a great job like just calling shots from the the the, the hotel and then when he's on the ground calling the shots it's just so good yeah he's a natural born leader and i you know i still submit that chris evans is the only man to ever play this role um this is why you don't recast captain america i just think he is well, I say that with due respect to Anthony Mackie, but if we're talking about the role of Steve Rogers, you don't recast that. Um, I love the idea of Sam as Cap for a whole lot of other reasons. But the Steve Rogers character, this should, yeah, Evans is the man for sure. Um, seeing him calling the shots, you can you can believe this guy is on the battlefield 100%. Uh, I'd listen to him. <laughs> Tom, go do this. Yes, sir, Cap, you got it. Yeah. Like, I'm on it. Uh, there's so many cool scenes in this thing. I mean, um, him initially jumping in to the building with the with the gas oh. and throwing the shield at the ground and t- and taking that guy out. That was great. Um, Nat being Nat and just taking out an entire crew of guys by herself. Uh, <laughs> this is so many cool beats here. She's so good. She's so good and she's great. And and Scarlett Johansson is not a big person at all. But man, the the combination of the stunt work being on par, the close ups, the CG when they when they need to use it, um, the fact that these actors and actresses are getting up close and personal and taking their licks as they go, I mean, uh, it's entirely believable to me. I call it Hollywood magic, call it what you will, but I wouldn't piss her off. I'm just saying, um, yeah, it's great stuff. What about Crossbones' suit looking so good, and the fact that he's keeping his face covered is for a good reason. And his mask isn't overtly heelish. It's not very comic booky. It feels like real world gear, gear he's wearing in the scene. Yeah. I love that. He is um, wearing a very tactical helmet. Um, yeah. He's not wearing like a luchador mask. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's uh, like Bane, like, like his... Bane from the Batman comic. 
Yeah, and he's got actual gear to deal with the fact that he's fighting enhanced. Like, he's not out here trying to fight enhanced guys with his bare hands. Mm. Like, he knows what he's up against. And you can see that he's been waiting for this fight because everything, he's prepared. Um, Like, I think one of the coolest things is, like, right before he actually had the fight with Cap, he throws that bomb on the shield to get the shield out of his hand and then starts fighting him hand to hand. Um, He's ready. (laughs) He's prepared for this fight. Yeah, like you said, he he knows what he's getting himself into. He knows what Cap is. He knows who Cap is. He's fully prepared. And he knocks Cap on his back a few times in this fight. And oh, the fight's man. awesome. I when we first see him, he comes out of that uh he's in that tank and he's shooting that rock, that uh grenade launcher. Mm-hmm. Um and he's just like <laughs> he's just blowing up everything and they have this really cool shot of him um shooting a grenade into that window and Cap flying out the other side, and you see the shield flying out behind him. It just looks so cool. Oh, yeah. um, or I completely forgot when he runs into Nat, and Nat looks like she could kind of get the best of him, and he throws her into that truck and throws the grenade in behind her and closes it. And not for nothing, but she's dead at that point for real. But she finds a way to shield herself with one of the other soldiers, and so it blows her out of the back of the van, and she's okay. <laughs> But, you know, hey, whatever works, man. We don't want to be dead. I'm just saying. Uh, one of my favorite bits in, in this whole sequence is the Red Wing part where it, it saves uh, it saves Natasha. And <laughs> and she thanks him. She says, uh, uh, she says, and he says, well, don't thank me. She goes, I'm not thanking that, thanking that thing. And he says, his name is Red Wing. Go on, pet him. So good. So good. I'm with you. Like, see, I, dude, I'm old school combat guy. So I grew up with the with the Falcon, with the open bare chested costume and with the actual Falcon flying around. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love, they worked that in. That's Marvel, man. They think about this stuff. Yeah. I, yeah, I was really happy to see them use red wing. Yeah. Um, as we said, kids, the battle between cap and crossbones is great. The helmet finally comes off. Uh, the makeup job is pretty spot on here. He looks really good. You can tell it's him, but he's, he's pretty well scorched. Um, he tells Cap that Bucky remembers him or remembered him, uh, and claims, "Please tell, please tell Rogers when you got to go, you got to go." And then he says, "And you're coming with me." He hits a button. Uh, he's going to blow himself up here, folks. Wanda sees it in time, contains the explosion, forces him up into the air, and then into the side of a building. So, hard hitting question number three, Phil: What else could she have done here? What would have been the answer, or was there one? Um, I think the thing that is so great about this scene is, um, I feel like by the time we get to this movie, um, most of the heroes are emotionally compromised. And I Mm. think this moment shows you just how emotionally compromised Steve is because any other time he would have been on his game and he mentions this later, but the second, um, Rumlow mentions Bucky, he, he freezes. And he freezes long enough for Rumlow to get the drop on him. Before that, he wouldn't have let him do that. And so, no, there wasn't much that she could do. Um, but nobody would blame Steve for it because he's Steve. Like he's Captain America. He's seen as right. this guy that is, you know, you know, the best of the best. But now you're looking at someone who is a meta, and on top of that, um, she's not American. And so you can easily blame her for this, even though she did what she could to save Captain America's life. Um, And nobody's going to look at it like that, that she saved Captain America's life. They're just looking at that she killed a bunch of civilians. Yeah. Well, inadvertently. Um, Yeah, because I mean, I don't even like saying it. All Cap had to do is just punch him and he's out cold. Yeah. And I don't even like saying it like she killed them. Rumlow killed them. But, you know, the optic looks like, you know, it was an accident on her part. Right. And it goes to establish in the government's case that these guys are out of control. Yeah. And I mean, the other part of it is this is Wanda fresh out of Age of Ultron. Um, This is her first run with the Avengers. Mm. She's not an experienced hero yet. She doesn't, you know, you can make a case that maybe she could have done something more like, um, I don't know. There's there's maybe something else she could have done instead of throwing him straight in the air. Um, But she acted fast. She She's inexperienced. And, you know, you could also make the case for maybe this should have been Vision in the field and not her. Maybe so. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, maybe so. Um, I just think she was put in a in a tough situation, and she acted fast to save Cap's life. Right, of course. Um, we go from this to a very interesting uh, scene here. We go to a a, a CG, a very younged up version uh, of Robert Downey Jr. Of course, um, and we we neglected to mention him at the, at the beginning of this uh, this this show here, folks. Um, Tony's in this movie, so there you go. And it's Robert Downey Jr. Obviously. But we get a very young up version of him, and he's with his parents. He looks and sounds great. Looks like the RDJ from the 80s uh, teenage films, for sure. He's talking to the John Slattery Howard Stark, as we pointed out during the course of these, of these reviews on the Captain America films. There's two different, um, two different Howard Starks in the MCU. There's Dominic Cooper that we know from the first Avenger, and there's John Slattery from the Iron Man franchise, and that's who we're getting in this movie. Um, as we said, it's RDJ, he's DH, he looks great. It's an odd scene because it's like a flashback, but it's not exactly a flashback because he's saying things in this that he never did say in real life. His mom is saying it's the last time they'll be together, which obviously she did not say. Tony says, I love you, Dad, and I know that you did the best you could. This is huge, massive foreshadowing of what comes that we come to see in Endgame because in Endgame, Tony got the opportunity to have final words with his dad that meant something and that, well, that actually meant something because he didn't get to say anything except something that a young idiot would say in his shoes, a spoiled brat, which is what he was, but he got to make it right, which is cool. Um, the tech that they're using is in front of a college crowd. He calls it the binarily augmented retro framing or barf, which is awesome. That's very Tony Stark, by the way. Um, it's a speech to an MIT class. He tells them that all their projects are now funded thanks to the, re they are now recipients of the September Foundation grant. He's reading a teleprompter to basically tell him what to say. The teleprompter ends with him including or introducing Pepper Potts. But as we know from Iron Man 3, Pepper is not there. Um, they have had what we would led to believe is a falling out. Uh, he ends the conversation with, go break some eggs. It's at this point that Tony goes off stage, gets an apology from the uh, uh, the girl about the teleprompter. He's headed for the elevator, and we get a very quick scene with Alfre Woodard, who does more maybe in this this little spot that lasted just a few minutes. But she's it, as as the old cliche goes, she could read the phone book and win an award for it because she's that good. Um, yeah, this is so good, dude. What about this scene where we get the flashback? And it leads up to this confrontation with Alfred Woodward's, Woodward's character at the elevator with Tony. Um, again, I think a theme of this is just how emotionally compromised each of our heroes are. And I think just the fact that he's supposed to be doing this demo for tech for MIT and he's thinking about his parents and you, you, this is the first time we see that he's still kind of grieving over his parents. He's never really gotten over it. Um, but again, this just shows you how emotionally compromised Tony Stark is. Um, and it's not just it's not just that with his parents. It's the stuff with with Pepper. He's just not there. He's not in it. Um, his mind's not in it. And I love that they foreshadow, like you said, something going to happen later in the movie with this scene. Um, they set up something that happened later in an Avengers movie in this thing. And they set up something that happened in a Spider-Man movie later in the scene. Yes. Like there's there's like man, there's like several things that come back to this scene. Um, and it seems like maybe a throwaway scene where we got to see some de-aging tech. <laughs> but there's so much that they managed to set up in the scene. Um I mean, it's not even just like the main thing that we get with um him and Bucky later. Uh there's a line in here that I'm completely forgetting right now. Um there's a line in this that he says to his dad um, as he's leaving. And of course, it's a line that he didn't really say, but it also ties to his relationship with Peter. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, dude, like you said, there's a lot of foreshadowing that comes out of this. And I didn't, I didn't think about the fact that they linked more than just one film to this scene. Dude, do we know why Alfred Woodard's character has not returned? Was she just meant to make this impact? <laughs> I mean, I'm just well, curious I mean, about that. Well, I mean, she is later in the Luke Cage show, which she's really oh, of good course. at. 
Um, but He's yeah, great. this yeah, this scene. I feel like if if you're trying to understand um, Tony's point of view on why he chose the Accords, like this is a big part of why. Yeah. Um, this is a very tugging at your heartstrings point when she explains that she'll never get over it and him you know the avengers basically you know murder her son and you know it's it's sad it's very gut-wrenching um but then again you've got this guy that's gotten kicked in the teeth by everything he's a hero and he's rich and he's kind of in this scene telling you how alone he feels like and just then he walks off stage with all this stuff on his mind where he's trying to escape a conversation with somebody else and then he gets kicked in the teeth again by somebody that's like by the way you murdered my teenage son <laughs> yeah no matter what he does he never does the right thing like he was selling weapons to what turned out to be arms dealers like really bad guys and when he realized he was doing it he stopped well bad stuff came because of that and so then he, he becomes an avenger bad things come because of that like no matter what this guy tries he's trying to do the right thing he can't get the relationship with Pepper squared away till much later. It takes forever to make that happen. No matter what he does, he keeps screwing up. Like this guy's life should be fairly easy. You know, got all the money in the world. He's one of the smartest guys on the planet. And his his life is a shambles from the first time we see him till now. Um, yeah. And I mean I think it just goes into, you know, not just, you know, the life he grew up in. But the fact that he, he, you know, he lost his parents and everything else that happened to him, uh, you know, at, at this point in his career as a superhero, he's just <laughs> he's just going through a lot. And I don't think he ever dealt with it in a real way until way later on. I feel like until Endgame, really. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And the one line that she says to him in here is great when she says, uh, uh, you think you fight for us? You just fight for yourself. Who's going to avenge my son, Stark? My son is dead, and I blame you. Which is, like you said, gutting. I don't know how you come back from that. Um, yeah, I mean, but if you notice, and again, if I have to tug at, this is a Captain America movie, her jab at him is essentially what Steve said to him in Avengers. Yes. <laughs> you won't You won't make the tough choice. You won't be the one to lay down the wire. Yeah. Yeah. It, he's he's basic. She basically told him, like, you're selfish. Like, you aren't trying. You're not trying to help people. You're trying to showboat. Yeah. You know, I would love to see that this particular character at some point make a small cameo or show up and then maybe have the chance to say that she forgave Stark because of what he did. You know what I mean? Nah. Like, somehow she's made peace with it. I don't know. No, nah, she's totally joined Hydra. Nah. <laughs> 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 Full blown heel. <laughs> oh, that's good. As she she joined Hydra, they changed her identity. She ends up in Harlem, and <laughs> there you go. There's the backstory, kids. So uh, <laughs> the next scene we get is uh, we get to see Avengers Compound, which is cool. We only got a a taste of that. I guess it was at the at the end of um, Age of Ultron. I guess it was. We got to see it. Um. This is one month after the explosion in Lagos, so they're moving the story right along. The story is that 11, 11 Wakandans were killed in the explosion. We see King T'Chaka giving a press conference. Uh, Wanda's watching a news report where she's being blamed. She believes it's her fault. Steve comes in and does what Steve does. He tries to give her a pep talk, uh, tries to coach her up, basically is taking blame because he took his eyes off the prize. He froze, and um, he says another great line here. He says, we try to save as many people as we can. Sometimes it doesn't mean everybody. If we can't find a way to live with that, maybe nobody gets saved, which is awesome. Uh, great way to put it. Vision comes in through the wall, scares Wanda half to death because they're trying to teach this guy how to be human. Wants him to come in through the door. He tells Steve that Tony has arrived with the Secretary of State, who we don't know at the time, is General Thunderbolt Ross. And that's what really gets the wheels turning here, kids, because this is where we find out about the Sokovia Accords. Phil, he kicks off this little speech by saying that the world owes the Avengers an unpayable debt, and but that while a great many see them as heroes, there are some others that prefer the word vigilantes. They are a U.S.-based group of enhanced individuals who routinely ignore sovereign borders and inflict their will upon others, not concerned with what they leave behind. I love the writing. This is Marcus and McFeely at their best. They are killing it here. 
The dialogue is freaking phenomenal, and I'm in the bag for it from the time this movie begins to the time it ends. I don't think there's one line uttered that takes me out of this film. I mean, the way he he's presented, this, of course, is... Uh, uh, this is William Hurt doing uh, his level best to make you hate him, but also understand him at the same time. He is great. Um, such a talented actor. And yeah, this is really good stuff, man. Talk about this scene and the advent of the Sokovia Accords. I mean, from their perspective, this makes total sense that these guys are going to have to start, for lack of a better term, registering with the government or at least turning over the reins of this Avengers idea to the United Nations. Um, man, there's so many smart things they do here. Um, they bring in Thunderbolt Ross, who we know is Thunderbolt Ross, and he is not doing anything for co- completely altruistic reasons. We we already know that from the Hulk movie. Um, and having him mention, like, where is Hulk and where is Thor and basically comparing them to weapons of mass destruction is totally a Ross thing to do. Yeah. Um, and then him basically playing their greatest hits of like the worst, you know, disasters that have come from them trying to save people was just a total douche thing to do. Him just playing these videos for them and making them feel horrible, especially Wanda playing the logos video clip, like a month after it happens, just a horrible thing to do. <laughs> and like, I, at the same time, it does make his case even stronger looking at it from the outside in, but everything we know about Ross is he's just not a good guy. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, they send in the uh, the big gun for this, and it works. Um, I don't know if it works, but it does the job. It gets the point across. The line that he gives them is great because Steve is basically a, a defending what they do as a team, and he says, do you know where Thor and Banner are right now? If I misplaced a couple of 30 megaton nukes, there would be consequences, which is, listen, not to side with the government here. That's a bad look. Um, I kind of get what he's saying. Like, you guys, you guys are regulating yourself, huh? Where's these two dudes at? Ah, I'm sorry. I kind of see where he's coming from. Like, if Steve had had an answer, maybe that would have gone differently, but he didn't have an answer for him. He didn't know. I mean, he, he, of course, has a point looking at it from how this affects the world. Right. But from the inside of the room and knowing that Banner and Thor are people, <laughs> like, well, it's like, yeah. it's a terrible way to say it. <laughs> um, um, like, and especially Banner, because Banner is a guy that has, you know, has has dealt with a lot of, you know, issues with his identity because he's Hulk. And that is why also this movie builds off a lot of things so well because in any other circumstance, Banner would be in a room to tell them we cannot listen to this guy. Um, and that's why it's so it's so smart to have him off the board right now. And you know, not for nothing, the character has spent the past, what, 15 years, give or take, trying to stay away from trouble. But yet the government keeps chasing him and making him hulk out when he doesn't want to hulk out. Yeah, and that context is missing. They yeah. don't they don't understand that part of this is not him coming in to do the right thing and put them in check. It's part of them it's part of him knowing that he now could be able to be at the forefront of this and have control over what they do. Yeah. And Steve sees that right away. And if Bruce was there, he would have told them the same thing. Absolutely. Bruce knows what's up. Yeah. He knows this guy better than any of them do, I think. Um the fact that he showed up with Tony is very telling, but we don't know exactly what's going on, but we'll get there in a, in a scene well, I mean, here. It, it goes all the way back to the credit scene from uh, um, Incredible Hulk. Yep. You're right. Cause he's sort of getting it. He's not sort of, he's getting in his ear right then. Yeah. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. Everything ties back folks. Tom Clark 6M podcast is sponsored in part by Radius Law Group. Every day, Radius helps individuals, families, small businesses, and nonprofit organizations throughout North Carolina, Florida, and Pennsylvania resolve their legal issues by providing effective legal counsel in the areas of estate planning as well as elder law and Medicaid. Radius Law holds the radical belief that working with a lawyer can indeed be enjoyable. So give them a call at 1-800-519-5667 for more information and tell them that Tom Clark 6M Podcast sent you. 
He basically says for the past four years, you've operated with unlimited power and no supervision. The Sokovia Accords have been approved by 117 countries. That number's thrown around a couple of different times. They will operate now under the direction of a UN panel and only when and if the need arises or calls for it. And the UN is going to, are going to meet to ratify the Accords. Uh, Nat asks, what if we come to a decision you won't like? He says, then you retire. Great line. I love this guy so much. He said, it says it's so matter of fact, like, then you retire, moron. <laughs> That's basically what he's doing. Like, this is not a conversation, people. I tell you, you retire, you're done. Like, oh, I love it, actually. It's good. Yeah, he does a great job of um, having, basically having what looks like the moral high ground here and just rubbing their noses in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's very smug and very cocky. Um, from this, we go to Cleveland, of all places. Uh, we see a fender bender outside. Someone is coming to the door. The guy inside is not very happy about any of this. He's maybe a little paranoid. We don't get any background on what's going on here. We don't know this is Baron Zemo yet. Um, basically, this guy bursts in, and we end up, we see him. He's taking a sledgehammer to the wall. He finds the book that we saw in the beginning of this film. He calls this man Colonel. He's got him flipped upside down with the water running and his head in the sink. Whew. Vicious. All kinds of vicious. He says, mission report, December 16th, 1991. He wants to know the story. He wants to know what's going on. Colonel tells him where he can go. Obviously, Zemo says, he turns the water off and says, Hydra deserves its place on the ash heap. And he will use other bloodier methods to get the information he needs, but he doesn't want to do that. You'd only be dying for your pride. The guy doesn't answer, so Zemo turns the water back on, and the guy, before he drowns, says, Hell Hydra. Phil, again, as we said in The Winter Soldier and The First Avenger, First Avenger in particular, actually, Hydra must have a great dental, and they got <laughs> great benefits, because, man, till your dying breath, you're talking about Hell Hydra. That's insane. Um, man. The thing that I think that is so great about this scene is they set up right away that Zemo is not a Hydra guy, mm. uh, and he does not care about what Hydra wants to do. But he does have a plan, and he's going to be as vicious and terrible as he can be. Um, ah, man, I cannot say enough great things about Daniel Brule. He's just oh. great in this role. Um, I've seen him in other things, and he's just always great. Um, underrated in um, Rush, by the way, with... Uh, and an Avenger <laughs> and Chris and uh and Chris Hemsworth. That's uh-huh. a really good movie. Um and he was fantastic in it, but he just he's so good in this movie, man. Yeah, he's great. He uh let's say that the guy tells him. Does he does he walk away? Cuz this guy can't ID him. He doesn't know who he is. I mean, does he walk oh. away from this or does he go ahead and kill him anyway? Oh, he he totally was going to kill him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I for sure think that maybe he wouldn't have made it quite as painful yeah, I, I, I think maybe? he still kills him anyway uh, <laughs> there, there's a I don't know if you ever played it but there's a Punisher game um, on the first Xbox oh. and one of the coolest things about the game is you can interrogate people in like these crazy ways like put them under a hacksaw or use all this stuff in the environment to interrogate them and they always give you the choice at the end um to let them go or kill them. Yes. Um, I always would kill them just to see how cool it would look, just how graphic <laughs> and crazy it would look. <laughs> and you're not supposed to do it. You actually lose points if you kill them. Um, <laughs> you're supposed to let them go. But I always would do it. <laughs> that is one of the most vicious and sadistic games I have ever played. And I played it so much. I played it so much that I had the cheats unlocked for him to become invisible. Like no one, no no one could see him in the in the room. It got locked on that mode, and I couldn't get it off. So like I couldn't play it from that point on. With that, you couldn't even see Frank Castle anymore because somehow <laughs> it got stuck, and all you could see was like forty fives floating in the air where he was supposed to have been. Yeah, dude, man, I that, love that game, man. That's such a good game, man. Yeah, it is crazy good. It's so incredibly violent. Very I, violent. Did, if you release that game today, people are going to be, you know, all up in arms about it. And that thing came out in like 2000, I think. Yeah. Jeez. 
very very violent game and it, it always had like stuff that was unique to where he was like he was in an aquarium or somewhere yes and you could interrogate this guy over the shark tank <laughs> did you yeah, ever accidentally interrogate someone too hard and you didn't mean to and, and you ended up killing him anyhow oh yeah y'all of course <laughs> God, let's just do a whole episode on that game because it's so worth it. Um, yeah, what a game, kids. Go look it up. It's good stuff. Uh, the next scene that we get, uh, this is where we really start to get in thick and get in deep here with the disagreements between Steve and Tony. This is some of the smartest dialogue in this movie, and there's a bunch of it here, folks, but this is good stuff. Um, Rhodey is completely on board with this. Rhodey's a soldier, Phil. I don't know if we would have expected anything more from him. He was a soldier. I mean, he wasn't, you know, Don Cheadle in the first Iron Man, obviously, but he's always been a soldier. He's Tony's best friend, but he's kind of been, listen, I take orders. I follow orders. That's my first commitment. Everything else is number two. I can kind of see why he was side with him. Sam has no reason, honestly, to trust anything the government tells him and with good reason also. Um, They are the first disagreement we see here. Um, Vision raises his hand and basically says uh, that there may be a causality between the rise of the heroes and the advent of disasters. He feels their strength invites challenge, and that challenge incites conflict. Um, Nat says that Tony's being quiet. Steve says, well, of course, he's already made up his mind, which really sets Tony off. And that's when Tony shows him the photo of Charles Spencer, Charles Spencer the young man who was killed. And Sokovia, the one that he was told at the about the elevator by Alfred Woodward's, Woodward's character. Um, he says that Charles was building sustainable housing for the poor in Sokovia. We dropped a building on him uh, while we were beating down the bad guys, to, in other words. He says, we need to be put in check. If we can't accept limitations, we are boundaryless or without boundaries, and we're no better than the bad guys. This is good stuff, Phil, because Steve comes back with, We have to take responsibility for our actions. This document just shifts the blame. Rhodes says, Steve, that's dangerously arrogant. This is the United Nations we're talking about. It's not the World Security Council. It's not Hydra. It's not S.H.I.E.L.D. Steve comes back with, but it's run by people, and people have agendas, and those agendas change, which is direct response. This is the cap after Winter Soldier, who would feel this way. We don't necessarily get this cap before the Winter Soldier, who would feel this way, because he's seen the the slimy underbelly of how the government lied to him. Of all the soldiers you could lie to, you lie to him, and he doesn't approach it that way. But maybe everyone else does. Maybe he should. What are you lying to me for? I've, I've proven my loyalty for years. I went in the eyes for you people. like. But yet they lied to him and didn't have a problem with it. And to sum this whole thing up, this is really good, dude, because he's going back and forth with Tony um, because Tony fires back at the agenda line. He says, that's good. He said, that's a good thing. You know, he said, when I realize what my weapons are capable of in the wrong hands, I shut it down. Steve says, that was your choice. If we sign this, we surrender our right to choose. What if this panel sends us somewhere we don't want to go? What if there's somewhere we want we, that we need to go, but the panel won't let us? The safest, the safest hands are still our own. Dude, if Steve didn't win you over or win anyone over after that, I don't know what would do it. Because at that point, how could you be in the theater and not agree with Steve here? Yeah, there's so many good parts about this this scene. Um, I think I think Rhodey is the most understandable here because in the past, this is this is a conversation Rhodey would have with Tony. And now, Tony's on his side. Um, so he's just like, yeah, I'm right here. And I've got my friend on my side. Like, I've been trying to tell him this from the beginning. Like, <laughs> like you're being irresponsible. Um, and Sam's point of view is absolutely understandable because he's kind of a deserter. He's a guy that has left the service. Um, he's only doing what he's doing now because he wants to help Steve. Um and even to a degree, uh, Nat is understandable because she's just like, we're talking about fighting the government. Like, fighting the government is different than fighting the bad guys. Um, but you're absolutely right in that Steve's point of view is is changed by 
Winter Soldier, even that scene in Age of Ultron where they're talking outside and they're chopping the wood and he and he rips that log in half and he's like and he gives him the line of oh I can't remember verbatim, but he gives him the line that every time a war starts, there's somebody behind it that pulls the trigger. Um and he knows like regardless of, you know, whether the government's telling him right now that, you know, we'll only dispatch the Avengers when, when we need to, or when it's a, it's the right time to, he knows that that will not lead to good things. Yeah. They'll, they'll deploy them for things that they shouldn't be in the middle of or things that they don't fully understand. And they'll have even more blood on their hands that they won't understand. We're talking about them going from, um, doing things on accident to doing things by design yeah right right because like you said this shifts blame because then the united nations will take the blame and then that god dude, well, that opens up a whole other world of problems well not even just the united nations will take blame the united nations can send the avengers into a conflict and they can kind of take their hands out of it and mm-hmm. the blame will only be on the avengers mm-hmm. um and the Avengers will be the ones that look like, for the lack of a better word, to maybe somebody else in another country, like terrorists. Um, and that's a very, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting conversation. I think that Tony actually made really good point. Um, he, of course, used the most emotionally manipulative thing to do and bring up the kid. Um, mm. But all, he also has a point. Um, but. At the same time, you get into, again, how emotionally compromised they both are because he's talking about this kid and they're kind of looking around like, okay, and then he gets the call that Peggy is dead. And yeah. it's just like there's so much going on in all of their lives at the same time. But then at the same time, you've got the government trying to dip their finger. <laughs> yeah, and we we're talking about the United Nations bit. It reminded me of um, that line in Predator when Dutch, Arnold Schwarzenegger's character, says... Uh, you know, you put the six of us or the seven of us together, whatever it was, and you drop this in a meat grinder. That It reminded me of that because you're right. They could drop them anywhere they want to and then just take hands off and say, oh, well, uh, we told them not to go uh, or they disobeyed. And they can't prove anything. And then it becomes, you know, it's another weird comparison, but like the A-Team was a major hit, a major hit. Uh, but then the show really started to go downhill when they introduced the idea of the government taking over the A-Team. And now the team had to answer to the government. I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Horrible idea. Wretched idea. So there you go. Um, all kinds of problems with that. But as you said, Tony has a good argument because he says, and this is so good. If we don't do it now, it will be done to us later. Yeah. I mean, um, how do you fight that? Yeah. And you also get the idea that... um we get the idea in Winter Soldier that um, Steve is new to this world. He's new to like this new era of how, you know, politics um, has to do with warfare. Um, Tony's not. Tony has, has lived in that world for a long time. And he knows that if they don't go along with it, they're going to come up with something that is a thousand times worse and they won't have a choice anymore. Um, and so I think him and and Nat's point of wanting to be at the forefront of it and trying to steer it in a better direction is an understandable one. But at the same time, we are dealing with the government. <laughs> like yeah, the government right. is going to try to do what they want to do. Um, and there's only so much you can, you can do. The other part about this that I don't think people catch is Tony is looking at this from the viewpoint of someone with wealth. And Steve is looking at this from the viewpoint of someone that has always been poor. Mm. Um, so his belief in the government is different in what Steve would believe because he's seen he's seen it he's seen it from the point of view of a soldier, and he's seen it from the point of view of someone that had nothing. Excellent call, excellent call. That's real. That's a dude. That's digging deep. But that makes a lot of sense because we did see the background of both these guys and Tony's had everything he's ever wanted in his entire life. And Steve had nothing <laughs> ever. Of, of course, we're, we're talking about a, the ultimate guy with privilege and Tony Starks. He's thinking of, oh, well, you know, we'll just deal with that when we get there. Of course, he would think that way because he's never had to struggle. Yeah. He's never had to. He's never had to. 
whenever he's fought the government, he's won because he's he's had money and he's had the he's had the means to outsmart it. Um, Steve's not looking at that, st- looking at it that way. In his mind, we are under the thumb of them. They have more power than us. Dude, what about and and it, exactly right? By the way, we we jump from that to this scene because I, I want to get into this. This is Peggy's funeral, uh, and we know from what happened in the Winter Soldier um, that she uh, is in a nursing home. She's in ill ill health, and she's got dementia, and things are not looking good for her. And uh, we find out out of the blue here, in, in case you but people didn't know going into this thing, that Sharon Carter. This is actually Sharon Carter. Peggy Carter's great niece for the sake of the movie. She is her great niece now. Uh, cause they, they made her far enough removed, uh, for reasons. And now she's her great niece. She gets up there and she talks about this. I got to tell you, man, it, it, I don't think we ever got enough of seeing Haley Atwell and Chris Evans together. I wish we'd gotten more flashbacks. I wish we'd got some stuff that maybe we didn't get to see in the first Avenger. Um, and you know, not for nothing, but she kisses, he kisses Sharon later, who maybe he's kind of related to now. It's a very weird Luke and Leia thing happening, sort of. Uh, but dude, this whole scene, which takes place in London, this is really good stuff, man. Like we see Steve and he's, we're reminded again of, like you said at the beginning of this thing, who this movie's about, what movie this is. Um, she quotes Mark Twain in this eulogy. It is freaking great stuff. Um, and there's, it, it comes from a gigantic, um, uh, a gigantic, uh, like two or three, four paragraph uh, uh, writing here of Twain. But to sum it up, it goes comp- compromise where you can, where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right, even if the whole world is telling you to move, it is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say, no, you move. Dude, I love this scene so much. And that quote is something to take with you everywhere you go. It's so awesome. Um, this kind of reminds you, in case you'd forgotten, this is a Captain America film. I mean, was this the best way to sort of write Peggy out of the Captain America story? It's a peaceful, there's nothing weird happening. It's not dramatic. She didn't die in his arms. A villain didn't kill her. You know what I mean? Like this is maybe the best way to handle it. You think? Um, I thought it was great to if if Captain if this is the end of his trilogy, I thought it was a great way to take something um, that has kind of stayed with him his entire tri- his entire time in his trilogy of that's his girl and that this is always going to be the one that got away from him, and take him out of this conflict that he's in with the adventures and go to the, go to the funeral. And basically hear her speak from beyond the grave to tell him, no, don't, don't do, don't do this. Mm. And I have always read this scene to, to feel like maybe he signs the accord if he doesn't go to that funeral. Um, if he doesn't hear her speech at, at that funeral, he might have signed the accord. I think that was the final nail to tell him, no, I'm not signing that. That's good stuff. What about Natasha showing up at the end of this scene and basically she's you know they're talking and she's telling him that he's she's sorry for his loss and all this and and uh she tells him that tony vision and roadie have signed clint is retired and wanda is to be decided and she says staying together is more important than how we stay together and steve asks um uh what are we giving up to do it and he says i can't sign it she says i know And he says, then what are you doing here? And I thought, oh, God, they're going to fight. For a split second, I thought, she's going to start fighting him in the church. But then she's like, I didn't want you to be alone. And she hugs him. And man, if that don't put a tear in your eye, you don't have a soul. Because that that goes directly back to Winter Soldier and everything they went through together. And me asking you many questions over the course of that show. Why did these two never hook up? I continue to see reasons why this could have worked in a different reality. Because, man, there's moments when they feel really, really good together. And when she says, I didn't want you to be alone, it's awesome. I love that so much, dude. It's great stuff. Um, I think she understands him more intimately than most of the Avengers. Um, because she spent more time with him, you know, whether it be through Winter Soldier. And then we get through Endgame. 
Like she spent more time with him than most people. And I probably the only other person on the team that's closer than him is Sam. Um, and so I think she understood in that moment that, nah, this isn't about him signing the accord. I'm trying to reason with him, but I also need to be with him as his friend. Um, like he, she probably knows what Peggy meant to him and she just wanted to be there for him. And I thought that was a great team. Yeah. It's great stuff. Cause you know, we start to see allegiances happen. I mean, we see it pretty early in this film, but we start to see people sort of pairing up. And the fact that Steve and Natasha would be paired up would make a lot of sense. Even though they are on opposite sides here, they have every reason in the world to be um, sort of on the same side. And they'll get there eventually. Um, so we go to Vienna for the United Nations Conference. They're, this thing's moving quickly, kids. They're going to try to ratify the Sokovia Accords. We get to meet the great T'Challa, Chadwick Boseman, for the first time in the MCU. He and Natasha are speaking. Right off the bat, Phil, these two are connecting. Um, right from the jump. And he tells her that two people in a room can get more done than 100. And she offers apologies to King T'Chaka for what happened in, in uh, Lagos, which is great. We see a great moment between T'Chaka and T'Challa. Um, it's awesome. We don't know this, but it's their last moment together as father and son, at least in this realm and listen in this world. And T'Chaka gets up there, and talks about the stolen vibranium. He says they will fight to improve the world. They wish to join T'Challa sees the van pull up outside. Here's the commotion. He figures out what's going on, but before he can do anything about it, the explosion rips the place apart. T'Challa goes to save his father, but it's too late. And then we go from that scene to Sharon and Steve are together. She's stationed by the CIA in Berlin. And uh, we'll jump back here in a second to to uh, T'Challa and Nat. Steve asks if Peggy uh, knew she was spying on him. She says she kept so many secrets she didn't want her to have any from Steve. We come to find out that over 70 people are injured, 12 are dead from the explosion. They have released Bucky's photo as if he was involved and that he was the one that maybe did this. And then we see the scene with Natasha speaking to the child after the building or outside the building where he swears revenge. Um, dude, I have to tell you, the first time I saw this in the theater, I thought... Well, he's been programmed. He got him. He, either he's been programmed or he never got deprogrammed. He's back. He's, why did he do this? Like, dude, for, I bought it for a while. It didn't even occur to me that he had been set up till much later because I was just getting wrapped up into this story. Did you buy that he was behind this or did you have suspicions already that something weird was going on? Um, I thought that he got him. Um, they did this great scene later where, we see uh, Zemo reading out of the book, and we only see the guy's feet on the bed. So it looks like he's he's reading from the book to Bucky, and mm -hmm. we find out later, of course, it's not. Um, yeah, I think the way they set this up for us to not trust Bucky based off what we already knew was great. Um, man, I can't say enough about how well they cast T'Chaka. Um, he's, he's great. He just has this regal tone to him yeah. um, straight away. You... I mean, like from the first time we see him, we get this idea that he could be the king. <laughs> um, and man, we we got what, like less than two minutes of him and T'Challa in that first scene. And it's just so good. It immediately, you know, endears us to their relationship. Um, and so much so that, you know, when we get the death scene, like moments later, it hits hard because like we just got them and they had such a cool moment together. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'm sure, you know, we can go into just chat, how great Chadwick is as, as a uh, T'Challa, but like watching this again and knowing we're not going to see him as Black <sighs> Panther again, it's just heartbreaking. It's, it's for the proof that life is um, tragically unfair. Just, you know, good people should not be dying young. That's that's the only commentary I'll make on that because it's freaking ridiculous. Um, you're right about T'Chaka. This is John uh, Connie, I believe is how he pronounces his name. Um, of course, he reprised the role in Black Panther. Uh, fantastic. Really, really good stuff. Um, Steve calls Nat to check on her, and she doesn't realize he's. she should know he's there, but she doesn't know. She's telling him to stay away. He wants to bring Bucky in, and she warns him against it. Um, he goes into a bar and Sam is telling them to consider their options. 
And because he is, you know, Sam is great with the lines when it comes to Steve. He says, the ones that shoot at you usually wind up shooting at me, which is awesome. <laughs> uh, Sharon shows up, gives him some intel, says they have orders to shoot on site. Um, we see Zemo, Zemo in the hotel. It's the scene you were mentioning earlier about he's reading the activation words. Um, housekeeping's at the door with his breakfast. He takes it. We see something behind the bathroom door. We don't know what it is quite yet, uh, but we'll get there eventually. And then we finally get to see, after all the flashbacks have taken place, we get to see Bucky. He's in Bucharest. He sees a guy at the newsstand looking at him and then runs. He sees the paper and realizes what's happened. And then I was like, oh, well, he didn't do it. Because if he had done it, he would have known. Or they so he somehow forgot it's the programming. I don't know, but no, at that point I pretty much pretty well knew that no, nah, this guy didn't do it. This scene coming up, Phil, with with Steve and Bucky's apartment is great. The fight that follows afterward is tremendous. German special forces have arrived. Uh, Sam is filling in Cap in his ear the whole time. Steve asks him if he knows who he is, and uh, he says, "I read about you in the museum," which goes back to Winter Soldier. He says, "I know you're nervous. You have plenty of reason to be, but you're lying." He says, I wasn't in Vienna. I don't do that anymore. He says, the people who think you did are coming here now. They don't plan on taking you alive. He said, that's a good strategy, which is awesome. Um, he says, it doesn't have to end in a fight. He says, it always ends in a fight. He says, you pulled me from that river. Why? He says, I don't know. He says, yes, you do. Um, dude, this scene and the fight that follows afterward, we're seeing these old friends reunited. There's the bit where Cap is telling him, you know, no killing or don't, you know, you're going to kill somebody. And he, and he punches a hole through the floor and gets his bag. He says, I'm not going to kill anybody. He's in full control of his faculties here. This is not the guy that everyone thinks he is anymore. This seems important to rebuild the relationship between Steve and Bucky. And plus the fight that follows afterward is awesome. Man. Yeah. I feel like Sebastian Stan does some fantastic acting in this movie. Um, but you're right. I kind of got the idea of like, yeah, something else is up. Cause he wouldn't have been just walking around um, <laughs> and just, you know, freely buying plums and, you know, <laughs> just doing his grocery shopping. If yeah. he gets the idea that he's like a international criminal right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. You had to know something was up. I, I guess it was at that moment I did figure out, eh, I don't think he was the guy that did this after all, but I had to say, I didn't know it was, it was Zemo. I didn't put that together yet. Um, yeah, and it could have been that he just, he, he didn't know he was reactivated and he didn't know, but yeah, that scene did enough to make you question it. Um, and of course the scene in, in the apartment is great because, um, you get all of these great callbacks to, um, Winter Soldier and you get all of these like, um, willy wonty moments of, is he going to attack Steve or, you know, are they going to end up fighting? Um, yeah, and it was just really good. I, I mean. Uh, you've got a, uh, you've got Sam talking to him in his ear the whole time, letting him know that he's compromised. And um, when the <laughs> when the army comes in and they start coming into the apartment, um, and <laughs> they're just still talking like nothing is happening. It's just all of it is still great. And and plus, you know, these are two soldiers who are used to being in high pressure situation. And you know, Bucky's got ice water in his veins now. Because even when he's not programmed, he's still got that training, so he knows how to keep his calm. I mean, it's you know, whew. any other uh, instance, I'm like, I'm like, you know, screaming like a little girl and praying I don't get shot. But man, these two guys are ice cold. Um, the other thing that I noticed about this scene, this scene gives you enough to see why, even in this moment, why Bucky would be a good cat because he does a few he 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 does this a few times where he shields himself with his arm. And it's like, man, you can really see this guy with a shield in his hand, huh? Mmm, good call. <laughs> Plus, they have him handling enough through the course of these movies that you would start to think, hey, maybe, uh, maybe this guy. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. Uh, maybe not with the shield full time, but like you said, with some semblance of it anyway. Um. The, also, Black Panther jumps into this, and by jumping, we mean literally. Speaking of, of jumping into things, we got guys jumping from buildings to the roof of the building next door. It's insane. Everybody's acrobatic in this movie. It's crazy. Black Panther's there, of course, Phil, because he thinks Winter Soldier killed his father. He doesn't know the truth yet. I mean, he's obviously not going to stop till he kills this guy, 
or at least he's trying to. The helicopter shows up. Sam's there to help. This leads to a whole other fight slash chase scene in the tunnel. Dude, I, there's so much here to talk about. But, uh, of course, this scene is with everybody getting arrested. But, man, the, the moments leading up to that is great stuff. Marvel once again outdoes itself here. Talk about this sequence, man. What happens after they all end up on that roof and they're chasing each other through the tunnels here? Man, they had a uh, they had a tough task ahead of them of introducing two characters in this movie, and they're two like super popular characters in Black Panther and um, Spider Man, um, and to uh, figure out a way to introduce them and and give them time to shine was going to be difficult, and you've got that on top of this entire huge cast with most of the other Avengers here. Um, And I think the way they debuted Black Panther was great. I would actually argue that he had the best debut out of any character in the entire universe. Um, He looked so cool in this moment when he jumped out and he started fighting Bucky. And then he's just standing there getting shot and not budging, (laughs) not blinking at all, not even flinching. Um, and like he's getting shot by like this enormous gun from a helicopter, and he's just standing there like what? <laughs> it's so good. Um, right. And the other thing I didn't notice until I watched it this time, and it might be just because I've watched Winter Close Winter Soldier this close. Um, there's a there's a direct parallel to um, Steve chasing uh, Bucky out out of that window and chasing him, and. Uh, T'Challa jumping on the scene in a very similar way in this movie. Oh, good call. Good callback for sure. Um, it, yeah, it's a, it, it's a direct parallel. And I, I would be, I'd be really surprised if it was not intentional. Um, the chase scene is, I mean, man, the chase scene is so good. Um, one of the highlights of it every time I see it is uh, Bucky snatching this guy off of his helicopter and in one motion jumping in, jumping on it and turning around and just driving off. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's a good spot. Well, uh, dude, uh, thoughts on the Black Panther costume the first time we ever see it. How's it look in the sunlight? How's it look on him? How much of it do you think is real world that's going on here when we see him in the suit? I really like this suit and I actually like it better than the suit in the, in his solo movie. Um, I just like the the, te- the texture they went with for it. Um, it makes it 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 makes it um, look like something unique to an African superhero. Hmm. Um, man, the vibranium claws and everything look really good. All the accents um, with the vibranium look really good. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the Civil War suit. Yeah, I am too. And honestly, he needs to be streamlined. Black Panther, duh. He needs to be straight blind. At the same time, he's wearing armor. So, like, yeah. he he has to have some kind of bulk, doesn't he? He has to have at least some, right, for it to be believable. Yeah, I mean, and that's not to say I don't understand why the suit got changed later in his own movie. Um, it made perfect sense why they upgraded the suit, but I just really, I really like the way this suit looks. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I do like this suit better as well, actually. Um yeah, it, it's. I think he looks great. Um, like you said earlier, I love the fact that they managed to fit this in. They gave everyone great screen time, screen time, excuse me, uh, to get this done, to introduce this character the way he needed to be introduced, which is really good stuff. This entire scene ends with War Machine. He's shown up. He says, congratulations, Cap, you're a criminal. Black Panther takes his helmet off, and if you couldn't figure it out, kids, it's T'Challa. Um, Vision is cooking for Wanda. Uh, we go back to what looks to be sort of a normal thing, except it's an android cooking for a witch. It is what it is. <laughs> Wearing regular clothes on top. Ex- yeah, yeah, uh, you know. Uh, but hey, they're doing what they can here. Um, he's trying to, to make a traditional Sokovian dish. He begins to tell her that people don't hate her. He talks about the stone in his forehead, says he doesn't know what it is because we haven't seen Thanos yet, like try to you know wreck the world and stuff. Um, he doesn't know what his true nature is, but it's part of him. One day, maybe he'll control it. She wants to go to the store because he's basically screwed up the recipe. He won't let her leave. He says it's a question of safety. Tony wants her kept there until the Sokovia Accords are on a more secure foundation. Dude, this starts to feel a whole lot like house arrest to me 
and Steve calls him out later on this. Um, what was your thoughts on this when, when this moment happened in the film? Um, oh, there's so much good stuff here. And it's one of those things where when you watch it later, you can see so many um, nods to other things. Um, like when I was watching this, it immediately made me think of WandaVision um, and where these characters go eventually. Um, man, there's there's stuff from Age of Ultron. Um, there's, there's so many connections to this, um, man. And having introducing Clint and, of course, Clint coming in to recruit, recruit Wanda makes so much sense because of their relationship, um, not just because Pietro sacrificed himself, but, you know, just his uh, his uh, his pep talk to her that got her to come out of that uh, building in Age of Ultron. Yeah. You walk out that door, you're an Avenger. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, we're, we're on a flying island. Yeah. <laughs> we're fighting robots. And I have a bow and arrow. Yeah. None of this makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. The fact that they have him poking fun at himself as a character makes him more endearing to me, you know? Yeah, I've man, I've always said that Age of Ultron is what sold me sold me on Jeremy Renner as Hawkeye. I feel like Hawkeye in that movie is extremely underrated, and I feel like that was the moment where he made it clear that in some ways he's the heart and soul of the team. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Hundred percent agree. He is the George Harrison of this group. I'm just saying. So I got to keep my comparisons going, Phil. You understand. Um. So we go to Berlin. We're all over the world here, dude. All over the world. Uh, Bucky is getting transported. He's being held in a massive chamber. Uh, Sam is talking to to T'Challa. He says, you like cats? So you like cats, huh? And Steve's like (laughs) basically saying, don't poke fun at him, you know, which is awesome because Sam's having fun with this because he's a little ticked off and he should be. Um, T'Challa tells him about uh, the Black Panther. He says, I am now the warrior and the king. How long do you think you can keep your friends safe from me? It's a valid question. We get to see Martin Freeman, his introduction as Everett Ross into the MCU. He's freaking great. Much bigger role in Black Panther. He's so good at what he does. I can't wait till he and Cumberbatch share the screen together in a Marvel film. I don't think it's happened yet, and it very much needs to <laughs> for a whole bunch of great reasons. Yeah. He, um, yeah. So good. Such good stuff, man. Were you a fan of that Sherlock show, by the way? Um, I wasn't, but the other, the other callback is of course that, um, he was Bilbo in the Hobbit and the voice of Smog was Benedict Cumberbatch. Well um, done. I would love it a scene in, in this movie, in, in one of these movies where he goes, you know, have you ever fought a dragon? <laughs> That's great stuff, man. That's really God. I didn't even connect those two, but yeah, I was more in it for the Sherlock stuff. Um, um, uh, yeah, but no, the, the, the stuff going into this, uh, there are two scenes in this that again, like that just sold me on Chadwick as, as T'Challa and he'll say something very profound and then he'll immediately end it by going into something that's like a gut punch. Like when he was talking to Nat on that, um, on the bench and he explained, you know, the way that Wakandans see death and he was like, yeah, and death, you, you. You raise your arms and um, Sekhmet and Boss uh, take you out to the fields and you get to run forever. And then that goes, that sounds peaceful. And he goes, yeah, my dad believed that. I did not. And gets up and walks away. Yes. Um, <laughs> and this is the same thing where he says something very profound and then he ends it like, yeah. And how long will you think you will be able to keep me from killing your friend? <laughs> yeah, he's uh, so good. Yeah, you, you get the idea as a nice guy, but don't mess with him. And there you have it, part one of Civil War. As we said, it's a big movie, kids. Um, Part two, yes, an hour and 20, approximate running time for that one. So stay tuned for that. We will wrap up this film. I was going to call it a classic film, and honestly, if you're an MCU fan, it is a classic film. As we said from the jump, um, it means a lot to this universe. Uh, It means a lot to the stories that were told moving forward from this movie. We'll get to it in very short order. Get ready for it. But in the meantime, that is Captain America Civil War. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. Check out our social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at 6MPodcast. We'll see you next time.